As you know, this is uh, an annual uh, recognition and celebration of our campus's activities as expressed through our faculty. And there is indeed the idea of the faculty as supplying the intellectual capabilities the sense of faculty of the campus. Earlier, uh, indeed, one may say last week, we had a get together on uh, those who had had publications of books and other significant creative expressions last week. And we spoke in terms of a faculty constituting a community I think it is no more uh, a telling than today, although they are separated in three different categories of activities on this campus, namely scholarship, teaching, and service. One of the things that members of the faculty uh, uh, do is that of what is called preserving the intellectual capital of cultures and civilizations. And when we think of cultures and civilizations, sometimes we think of them in terms of buildings and museums and synagogues and churches and mosques. We think of them in terms of universities and the cinema and the theater and such going for. There is another area that is infrequently referred to when one speaks of that preservation, namely the beliefs and the belief systems and the passions and the images that is part of that civilization and the feelings and the resentments that sometimes are not as easily captured and as properly represented. They too are part of that which is to be captured and to be preserved and to be understood. It can be understood only in terms of certain modes of thinking certain modes of being. And I think that's part of what the three members of the faculty today represent for us, and that we are here to celebrate. And so, on behalf of the university, on behalf of the chancellor and the provost office, I want to welcome you to a conversation with our colleagues who, as part of an intellectual community, are committed to the preservation of those cultural expressions we just referred to, and who, in sharing them with us, help to enrich us and those who must follow the expression of the university, not simply as an expression of some buildings, of some classrooms, of some laboratories, etc., although they too are, but of that second nature, an expression of nature that we too are in our passions and our beliefs and our commitments and orientations. Thank you. Our first speaker is going to be Professor Elizabeth Fay. And I called her here to come and share her reflections with us. Thank you. I want to start um, by thanking both Chancellor Motley and Provost Langley for even offering these awards. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity. Um, and for giving us the chance to talk about what we do. I also want to thank my colleagues on both the department and the university committees for making today possible. Um, you know, it was a lot of hard work and effort, and I want to appreciate that. 
I've been asked to consider some specific ways in which receiving the faculty award for scholarship has made me reflect on my 25 years at UMass, so half of the, half of the century um, that UMass has been in existence. Um, and there are too many talking points I was given um, for me to really give all of them their due, but I, I want to think about two of them that I've been thinking deeply about ever since I received the award last June, um, and that is the award's impact on me as an individual member of the university faculty and also the intermingled relation of my scholarship in Romantic period literature and my identity as a faculty member, that is, as one who teaches and as one who serves, serves the department, my college, the university itself, and my profession of British Romanticism. Both of these matters, that of impactedness and of the thoroughly interconnected aspects of my academic life, are philosophical ones at times even ex existential ones, involving a great deal of angst and self-doubt, but also moments of real pride when my students rise to the challenges I set them or raise the bar themselves, or when a junior romanticist I've been mentoring publishes something truly spectacular. Impactedness is doubly oriented then, because so many others have impacted me, taught me, urged me to go higher, we are nowhere, nowhere without the conversation that is part of the life of the mind. I raise this because I've been asked to talk, to converse about scholarly achievement, which requires meditation, which requires intellection, which requires reflection. It is a moment to reflect on all the other faculty members at UMass Boston who have also published a great number of books, too many articles to list, who have given keynotes at conferences, the invitation for which was perhaps the greatest, greatest of honors, the highest moment of being singled out. And in fact, I did not know I was being nominated for this award and was astonished when my colleagues told me they had just submitted the paperwork, astonished that anyone would spend the time and effort to nominate me for this coveted award because it's so easy for scholarship to get lost in the shuffle, to go unrecognized at home, the place in which the daily service we do to our students and the institution is so imperative, takes up so much of our time and effort, and I must say, emotion. It is really something to come face to face with such recognition and generosity of spirit it entails. This nomination that is also an expression of collegial emotion of our entangled relations, of the pride we take in each other, recognizing that so much goes on out of the sight of the institution. Being nominated is one thing. It was an actual shock to receive Chancellor Motley's phone call telling me of the award, for surely I thought this had to be a mistake. There were so many other admirable scholars, researchers, and public intellectuals at UMass Boston who have not yet been given this award and whose publications or achievements set a high bar. Work such as theirs, which has always been part of UMass at Boston's identity, grounds my sense of what has always been to me a remarkable institution. I am talking not just of the past 50 years of UMass Boston, but also of the imperative of the future to rise to the challenge that public education now feels of ameliorating the elitism that private schools or well-funded public universities create. Good scholars, my dissertation advisor told me years ago when I went on the job market, can be found anywhere, and it's true. So the impact of the scholarship award was at first the shock of recognition. It made me think that perhaps in my scholarly work I was doing something worthwhile after all a thing I only think of conferences where other romanticists think and care about the same kinds of things I do. So I thought perhaps it would be okay to talk a little about this passion I want to recognize today, 
since at some level perhaps it does relate to a third talking point on our list concerning the relation with UMass Boston today and what is emblematic about it to its future. I'm thinking of emblematic here in terms of the emblem and what will be the trace of this emblem, its hieroglyph in the future embodiment of our institution. So I wanna talk a little bit about my current passion, a book project whose working title is Metaphysical Egypt. It will be my ninth book, my sixth book about British romantic literature. It's a book about the history of Western imaginative and philosophical thought about ancient Egypt, about its place in the long history of the Western cultural imagination. It's a project I've been working on for a long time, constantly putting it aside to work on something else more pressing. But in the last couple of years, it has become a real obsession. It's so easy to see ancient Egypt in everything I read. It bleeds across borders and at times becomes unmanageable. This book project explores an Egypt that is otherwise and elsewhere as what is always prior, serving as an originary vortex and abyss that is yet a starting point. The unknowable, unverifiable things that Kant labels cosmological ideas are precisely the grounding concepts of an occulted Egypt where it was believed the power of the logos could be reconstructed, origin could be determined, divine revelation first occurred, and matter, essence, and freedom were part of ancient esoteric teachings. My underlying argument is that romantic artists and scholars were drawn to Egyptian monuments as spirit tombs for the same reason they returned to the problem of decoding the hieroglyph, to make Egypt legible and to find in Egypt's trace the origin, thus translating that which is unlocatable, a vanishing point into an origination story. To set forth these ideas, I use an unorthodox history coupled with a way to come at that subterranean history. Amongst my reading of British and European Romantic period literature, I discovered that the decipherment of hieroglyphics is more than a linguistic achievement of the period. It is a variant history encoded form. Therefore, thinking about hieroglyphics and their prior reification in Egyptian mon monumentality is threaded through the literary and philosophical texts I discuss, and, I am so, and so I'm concerned here with the hieroglyph in its larger, more mystical and mystified sense as a trace of origin. This trace of ancient Egypt, this hieroglyph which indicates origin is what I am terming hieroglyphica. Its primary importance is reflected on by Novalis in his Logo Logical Fragments where he states, the first art is the study of hieroglyphs. In my book, I consider how, his, how Egypt can be the fundamental terrain for Western metaphysics in its priority as the archaic, associated with the urgrund, or what Jakob Böhme terms the ungrund, or unground, in which the early Gnostics, which the early Gnostics associated with the void. To think of Egypt in this way, as void, or ground, or unground, is to see it as the placeholder or figure for that which is inescapably prior rather than as what is presently there. Romantic era travelers to Egypt came face to face with this contradiction of ground and being there, translating this impassable distinction as an Egyptian origination, what was always already underground, literally manifested as buried tombs and as the supposed labyrinth beneath each pyramid or periodically uncovered as in the buried temples or great sphinx. For every Western interloper on Egyptian soil, beginning with Alexander the Great, Egypt's anteriority gains significance through a search for origins that depends on the before in order to ascertain afterness. This is the origination story. For the early modern world and its heirs, Egypt becomes the ground for heroically restabilizing efforts to translate what must have been into a new possibility for going forward. 
The going forward, however, is a recursive, his, recursive movement that depends on periodically recovering the original possibility. This is a necessary historical fragmentation, the history of knowledge as an illegible ruin that can provide the spark for resuturing of past to potential future. The problem of translation becomes one of suturing fragments required for the romantic era linguistic effort to restore lost languages to life, languages thought to be the origin of knowledge. The key to all ancient writing systems was thought to be a common root. The unlocking of one mystery would sever the knot. The romantic act of translation rehearses a similarly recursive logic, aligning origin with futurity in order to sever the knot of language, but instead it resulted in employing a systematizing or encyclopedic approach that only served to cover over what was different on a similable Unsurprisingly, perhaps, because such a project is always escaping from the historical, it is unable to leave an Egypt that is elsewhere. Alexandrian, Renaissance, Enlightenment, and Romantic projects could not displace a metaphysical Egypt precisely because an Egypt that is otherwise resists the effort to recover it by inhabiting its monumentality rather than its physical placement. It figures itself through its pyramids, obelisks, colossi, and enormous but unrecoverable antiquity as an untranslatably opaque presence in our cultural imaginary even today. Is that which we need to believe is there in order to translate our sense of historical movement into something that pushes us forward? So to conclude, my current book project is at heart about a fundamental, deeply anterior way in which what we believe pushes us forward, recursively through history and in our own lives, as we translate seemingly opaque but fascinating things into meaningful constructions. The impetus that is what I believe education and scholarship are all about. Of course, the people who get us there in the first place are our teachers, and on that note, it is my very great honor to introduce my colleague, Bob Chen of the School for the Environment, who received the Distinguished Faculty Award for teaching this year. Thank you. So um, like Libby, I, I, want to th I want to thank the Chancellor and the Provost uh, for this very um, humbling award. Uh, I'd like to thank the selection committees and, and the entire community, the students, the staff, the, the faculty. Uh, uh, for this. It's, it really is a, a, an honor to be uh, here in front of you, uh, and thank you for coming this afternoon. Um, I'm talking about teaching, or more broadly, education, and my, my field is science. So um, the, the challenge is um, how do we get science education from our perch here as a faculty member at UMass Boston to as many people as we can in, in, in as many facets as we can. And so I wanted to start with this um, cartoon here. Most of our education, most of our teaching, comes with this idea about a straight line. So we want to get every student to the same place. We want them to pass the MCAS test. We want them to get a score on the SAT. We want them to get uh, an A, whatever it happens to be. Um, and so this person, Dr. Musko Mostin, probably haven't heard of him, comes from physical education. Um, and he says, so if you have a straight line on a gym wall, and the middle person here reaches up and says, well, I can't touch the line now, but if I work hard and I lift some weights and I practice jumping and I work through the entire semester, by the end of the semester, I can reach and touch that line and achieve my goals. But the short person looks at that straight line and says, no matter how hard I work and I jump and I jump and I work and I lift weights, there is no way I can touch that line and I sort of don't learn as much or try as hard as I might. And the tall person says, so. <laughs> Our chancellor. <laughs> Things are easy for me. I'm past the line now. I don't have to start <laughs> working hard because I can touch that, that straight line easily. Um, and so this is true of all states with high stake testing. This is often true of Calculus 1 or Chemistry 1 where we say, this is the gateway to medical school. If you can't pass this course, pass, fail, if you can pass this course, then we can go on to med school. But all those other things that are not considered caring for people, your inquisitive nature about health, all that is, 
is, is tossed aside. Um, and oftentimes we have this conversation among colleagues and faculty here about, well, who do you teach? Do you teach the top third, the middle third, or the bottom third? And many people have different decisions, but a lot of them say, I'll teach the middle third, because that's in the middle. And so my argument is that we can change this straight line approach by making a slanty line and saying it's not the same for everyone, and we can teach all of our students. So in this case, the shorter person can work hard and reach that slanty line, the middle person can work hard and reach that line, and the tall person can work hard and reach that line. It's not all the same. We don't all learn the same things in every class. We come in with different experiences and knowledge and, and skills and understanding, and we leave with differences in all of those things, but we can help every student, every student, increase in some of those areas. So, um, so we're changing the nature. That starts with assessment, but it's also in, in the nature of, of your teaching. So, um, so I need your help. And I, I see my super TA <laughs> here who knows how to do this. Well, so I need your help. Um, I'd like you to um, write on this index card some ideas about how you teach all of the students that may enter your classroom, regardless of where they started, who they are, the experience that they have. And we only have about a minute. <laughs> so the, the, the prompt is, how do we engage all of our students? So picture a classroom, and I've got all the different students that are here, you know, short ones, middle ones, tall ones, or any way you want to think about that. How do I engage all of them? Not the middle third, the top third, every single one. Okay, and, and so now turn to your neighbor and discuss what you've written on your card and see if you can learn something from them and they can learn something from you. So another minute for that. Does anyone have an idea that they would like to share with the group? Anybody have an idea? Yes? So I teach computer science, so what I do in my class is I randomly assign my students into two-person or three-person group for them to do in-class exercise. Because for computer science students, I often found out they are not very outgoing. They kind of like, you know, they like to communicate with computers, not with other people. <laughs> so, so by doing this, so what I do is I do random assignment. So that means they actually, they cannot only speak with their good friends in the classroom. They're going to communicate with each other through the whole semester. And also the in-class exercise really helped me to identify the, the pattern so it helps with assessment, it helps with uh, students talking, it helps with peer learning. Yes. There's a lot of wonderful strategies about this. So thank you very much. And Haley, if you could collect those cards, I want to see everyone's ideas at, at the end here. So um, I'm going to give you three examples of work that I've been doing in the last 22 years. Um, the first one is uh, the audience is not the classroom. It's broader than that. It's Boston public. It's the T-Riders. So the subway riders, there's 400,000 per day. And we want to talk to them, educate them about climate change. It's a very strong issue, important issue in today's society. And in America, we don't have all the people thinking in, along the line that climate change is real, climate change is relevant to us personally here in Boston, and that we are doing anything about it. But in fact, Boston is one of the climate leading cities in the country and the world, uh, and also one of those that is most affected by sea level rise in the top seven cities in the, in the world. So uh, here's the milieu. We've got um, posters here on every platform in the red and orange line, and we have these little car cards inside the trains. And so what messaging would you put on there? And so we wanted to introduce you to Ozzy. Ozzy is an ostrich. It's a recognizable character. How many people have seen Ozzy? Oh, so a good number, so thank you. Um, uh, recognizable, inquisitive, non-threatening. It's very important that climate change messaging is non-threatening um, to the, the receivers. Um, and it pokes a little bit of fun at people that are burying their hand, heads in the sand about uh, climate change. And this is a, a, a partnership of a, a number of folks working on that. One example of the 12 posters that went up over 12 months on the T that has just ended at the end of November um, is this one about sea level rise. Is this the new normal for Boston? Um, mommy, blah, blah. Glad I have a long neck. So Ozzy is in all of these messages, but he starts a little bit um, um, 
he's questioning about climate change, and then he becomes more inquisitive, and then he becomes a climate leader, becomes, oh, I really understand that this is important to me and that I have to um, change that. And so um, we're thinking, we're doing the research now about what the T riders are, have changed in their, their attitudes, behaviors, and knowledge about climate change. And mostly it's about recognizing this harmless, non-threatening creature and the message of climate change. And so I think that there is a stronger preparation for future learning about climate change if they were to read an article or a newspaper, a headline or a commercial, that they'd be more accepting of that message. The second um, group is the K-12 continuum. So we know that the students enter into the university coming from not nowhere, coming from somewhere. And so we have to delve out into where they are learning before we can know who the students are that walk into our classrooms. And I've had the good fortune to work with a number of projects the Boston Science Partnership, the Boston Energy and Science Teaching uh, Project, the Watershed Integrated Sciences Partnership, um, and the Centers for Ocean Science Education Excellence uh, through the, uh, the last number of years. And uh, the idea here is that we um, work with doing science. Rather than reading about science or thinking about science or talking about science, let's get more students and more teachers and more faculty members <laughs> doing science. What does that mean? And we can define sort of all that. Um, this inquiry-based science. And to do that in the K-12 system, we have to work with the administration, but we really want to work with the teachers because they work with the students year after year after year. And we can also support the students themselves with direct connections to the science at the university um, and everywhere else within our, our professional network. So to give you an example of this, um, here's a graph from a few years ago about working with teachers in the Boston Public Schools and we've increased by tens of thousands of hours the amount of time that the teachers think and do inquiry-based science. So as better um, inquiry-based scientists, the teachers, and with more science content knowledge, they will become better teachers for the 20, 30, 40-year careers that they have uh, within the city of Boston. Does it make a difference for student learning? Well, here are the MCAS scores in eighth grade over the course of one of these projects. And you see that we're actually moving the needle. This is very hard to do, to move the needle by 10% from not passing to passing. And this is 60,000 students in the Boston Public Schools every year moving along. And the MCAS is a standardized uh, assessment of that. So there's an example of the K-12 continuum having impacts here, sitting here from our perch at the university. The last one I would like to talk to you about is university teaching and learning. And I, I specifically say learning here rather than teaching because I don't think of my job as the award for distinguished teaching. I think about how do I facilitate the learning of every one of my students in my classroom, every one of the students that I might run into in the hallway, every one of my advisees or mentees or what have you, anyone that I can have some impact on here at the university. And we know that students are thinking about and interacting with the world differently than when we were students. There is a lot more technology at their very fingertips, <laughs> and they are communicating and using and learning from these things. And we have to embrace some of the ways that students learn and figure out how they learn and take advantage of this. It's not a disadvantage. It's an advantage for us as teachers to increase their learning. Um, the other is really high technology, such as index cards. <laughs> so all of you were writing on the index cards, and all of you were discussing with your neighbors about a topic that was what we were talking about, teaching all, engaging all students in your classroom. So I don't have direct feedback except one from, from this very brief time, but I will have feedback from all of you because I'm collecting those cards. Uh, so that's just another act, uh, piece. This idea about passively learning, passively uh, listening to the sage on the stage, um, can we change that to actively learning? Can I embrace my brain moving in the class time, in the class periods that, that I'm, uh, I'm in the classroom? Um, <clears throat> we are really lucky to be here at, at UMass Boston in terms of the diversity of the students. And I've talked to several faculty members and several students lately who have gone to other places and come back. And they said, it's just not the same. It's too homogeneous. I don't see enough different ideas and perceptions and experiences walking in and in the discussion. It's just less rich. And so we should celebrate that advantage that we have here as the urban campus of, of UMass in Boston uh, and celebrate that diversity. And ultimately, it comes down to caring about our students. If the students get the indication of the real authentic 
piece that we care about them, care about how they are feeling, care about how they are learning, care about their achievements. They are, are less anxious, they are more comfortable, they feel supported, and they learn better. And if we can support and care about all of our students, they will all learn better. So um, I wanted to end with this slide, thinking about 50 years. Um, we have this uh, moniker, a research university with a teaching soul. And I'd like to thank the leadership over 50 years. It's incredible what UMass Boston has done over 50 years, starting as, as a small building downtown, moving out to this beautiful campus on the Boston Harbor, and seeing the changes in Boston Harbor over the years. And now with the new buildings coming up, and the increased growth of enrollment, and programs, and PhD programs, and everything else, Really incredible. But I'd also like to, this is just a snapshot, and some of the leadership has stabilized over the last few years, thankfully. But I'd like to say that what's really important is the tenured faculty to the culture of the university. So I'm here as one of the three faculty speaking to you today. Um, administrators come, administrators go. They have their different impacts. It moves along. But the university faculty here are for 20, 30, or 40 years. And we often hear that it's almost impossible to move a faculty, a tenured faculty member, in the way that they think, in the way that they do their research, in the way that they teach. And I would argue that one of our jobs as faculty members here, as the audience, the students are changing, as the world is changing, we must study how we teach. And we must continually improve how we teach. And I call it here the scholarship of teaching and learning. But we can change and adapt and continually do better for all of our students. So thank you for listening. Um. <laughs>
I don't need to go into detail. You've all known and thought about all these things, I'm sure. A few facts illustrate the connections and what's an economist without a few numbers. Over the last 30 years, about the length of my career here, the increase nationwide in the percentage of faculty has basically mirrored the increase in the number of students, proportionately. However, the increase in the number in administration has almost doubled over that same period of time. Furthermore, the proportion of the faculty who are tenure stream faculty has fallen greatly over that same period of time, those 30 years, and certainly the cost of education has risen more than the rate of inflation over 1,200% in the last 30 years. So those numbers kind of help us see the problem that we identified a little bit earlier. What has this meant for faculty service and governance? It means to me that the faculty have been increasingly sidelined in decision making in the university, and faculty government governance plays a less significant role in policy decisions, while the role of administrative decision making is increasing. Let me emphasize that these are trends happening throughout higher education in the United States. I'm not singling out UMass Boston by any means, which as a matter of fact has resisted a number of these trends to its credit. Regardless, these changes are a result of the proportionately fewer tenure stream faculty available to do university service. The existence of more administrators and therefore more top-down administration, financial pressures, and the two groups often having different goals in mind for the university. I don't argue that these trends are a simple conspiracy aimed at sidelining the faculty and decision making, but rather a combination of encroachment on faculty prerogatives and the faculty allowing such encroachment. It's interesting that the incursion happens because the faculty have many responsibilities and often are prepared to give up some of it to others. In other words, they're overburdened with service and they don't mind shifting it over to somebody else and lightening their workload. However, just as with our political process, it's dangerous to give up responsibilities because with them goes decision-making powers and rights. What are faculty responsibilities in the university with respect to service? At least here at UMB, those things are enshrined in the trustees red book, the collective bargaining agreement, and the faculty council's constitution. So from the red book and the collective bargaining agreement, it says faculty are to take, response, are to take primary responsibility in all matters of faculty status, promotion, tenure, salary, et cetera and to take primary responsibility in other faculty and academic matters. The faculty council constitution says faculty are to review and make recommendations on all matters relating to admissions, instructional goals, and it's the same for all policies related to budget and facilities, the same for all things having to do with planning and development of the campus, and finally the same regarding with the review and recommendation of programs. I ascribe to a model of the university run by the faculty, who I think have the expertise and commitment necessary to decide matters of curriculum and mission, and where administrators act as agents of the faculty, fulfilling the goals prescribed by the faculty. This model is driven by active, transparent, informed faculty, making decisions in faculty institutions at the university, college, and department level. This may sound a bit utopian to you, as I said, university service is exerting the rights and responsibilities of the faculty. Service is working to guard those carefully and struggling to reclaim those that have been allowed to erode. The point is to ensure the university reflects the goals of the faculty, all in the interest of having universities continue to play their crucial public role of equipping students to leave the world a better place than they found it. Despite my obvious misgivings about higher ed in general, I am incredibly grateful for the time I've worked here. Although I obviously think service is important in itself, it is much more rewarding when it's done in conjunction with talented, committed, and enthusiastic colleagues as we have here at UMass Boston. Working with faculty, the next 50 years have the potential to be even better than the last 50 
And having been here a good part of that first 50 years, I can definitely say that working here has been the best and most rewarding job of my life and the most fun to boot. I am sincerely grateful to have had this opportunity. Thank you. Another round of applause for our outstanding faculty members. So I do not think I'm in Hollywood or something like that today. Um, I've been suffering from an eye infection that I got a note today that allowed me to come back to campus. My staff wouldn't allow me to come back without a note indicating that I am not contagious anymore. But I got it from my wife. They said stay away, but we couldn't do that. Listen, you all are fabulous. Thank you for carrying on this tradition of having an opportunity for us to hear from you beyond honoring you and getting to know what our students have gotten to know for 30 years and 20 years and all those years you've been dedicated to this place. You know, I'm honored to be your colleague. Every day I walk these halls and I get a chance to talk with many of you or just to show up here and will represent you in whatever walk of life I've had an opportunity to do so in. I just continue to be proud and honored um, to serve. And so thank you for that. Today is just, we're building on a tradition that started and it started with Daniel and his team over in our wonderful library. And I sort of took a hook and said, let's, I'm sorry, but when you see something good, that's what you do. You try to pull it together. We decided that our winners at commencement would become those who presented on this day. You've done us proud. So grateful to you. Uh, we have a, and thank you, Provost, for knowing that I was trying to get here, trying to get that note, get clearance, all that stuff. I didn't want to miss this event. But now I'm back, and you're in trouble. So um, I know that uh, you may have already eaten the Mediterranean. Is it still a Medi Mediterranean reception? Is that over? OK, but there's more food. Is there more food in the back? More food in the back for us to fellowship and have a re reception in the back. So thank you, thank you, thank you. It's great seeing everybody.